It's Saturday the 4th of December and we welcome you to Culture and Cultural Capital in the Language Classroom by Rachel, Dr. Rachel Hawkes. Here she is, You're, you can see her already in the, the video, but here's a lovely, what I think is a lovely picture of her as well. Um, Co-director of NSELP, the National Centre for Excellence for Language Pedagogy. We also have um, David Binns, who when I asked him what he wanted to be known as, he is actually the Director of UK Operations, Sanico. He wanted to be known as the bloke from the North, but we decided, no, we'll give him his proper title there. So delighted to have you, David. And just to explain who I am, I'm Chair of the London branch of the Association for Language Learning, um, and we run this Zoom account and are really happy to host anybody who would like, who would like to be hosted here. So since we are an AWL Zoom account and Rachel, past president of AWL, we're very keen on AWL. It'd be great if in the chat now you could tell us if you're a member of AWL and encourage others to join. That would be really, really good. Let us know. It's a great organization. Stephen's here. Stephen will be very good at adding to the chat to tell you why you should join AWL. Um, as I've said, you'll always or you'll you'll get the information about this webinar through an Eventbrite mail. Um, but if you go to the AWL London site and click on webinars, you'll see a list of all of the webinars that we've had, including, including this one. And there's um, a list there. Just in case you weren't aware, this is the first of two Advent um, webinars. The second one is next Saturday, and you'll be very welcome to sign up on Eventbrite for that. It's a different address for that one. So um, here we are. This tells you about Rachel. You'll have seen this already on the Eventbrite. I'm leaving it there so that anyone watching back on the video can pause and read to find out just how experienced she is and how much she's got to give to the languages community. We're really, really, really lucky to have her. Um, and this is the session, and this is what she's going to be talking about. Before she starts, I'd like to really um, emphasize something which Rachel will be talking about, and that's to ask you, it'd be great if you can contribute to the charity which she funds. Rachel is a very generous person. She has come along and spoken at, to, at numerous AWL London events and has only recently, I think, discovered that she hasn't necessarily cashed any checks, which she only asks for travel. Well, I force travel expenses on her um, and I'm useless on money as well. So I haven't noticed that she hasn't been taking it. So <laughs> one thing I think is absolutely great is that Rachel is now saying that she wants to use any money which she gets for this particular charity. So she'll be talking about it. We'll be talking about it as well at the end. But if you can go to her Just Giving site, we'll be putting that link in the chat and it would be great if you can contribute to this really, really worthwhile course. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Right, I can't talk and do my screen sharing at the same time. So just bear with me a second. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. I'm just going to do the bit that I always forget to do until it's too late and no one can hear the audio that I'm trying to share. So I've done that now. It. And we can see you, that's great. That, that's perfect. Fabulous. Um, okay, I'm just gonna move myself over there so I can't see myself because that's distracting. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I, I know that I, I know many of you, but probably not all of you. Um, and um, so I'll introduce myself very quickly. Um, I'm Rachel Hawkes. I'm a languages teacher and leader, but I'm currently um, seconded from my school, not, not seeing my school very much at all, um, for three days a week to work as co-director of NSELP and also subject lead for Oak Academy. So in this session, what I want to talk about are some thoughts on language and culture and cultural capital that I've had sort of two years on after working with NSELP, um, but obviously acknowledging all of the other years that came before that and that that you, you know, that we all bring with us, we all bring all of our experiences along on the journey as we as we develop our practice. So a quick shout out to the NSELP team, because apart from anything else, I'm going to be sharing a lot of their hard work this afternoon. Um, in, the, in the resources, particular shout out to the, to the resources developers um, and to Emma Marsden, my colleague and director of NSELP. Um, and also the, 
the lead and hub schools who have been trialing these resources um, very patiently and with much enthusiasm for about 18 months now um, and we're still indebted to them for all the ongoing QA and feedback that that we receive so that's my that's my thank yous out of the way so let's get get started um, so I don't think I don't think there are I, I, I've never met a language teacher that would disagree with this. There may be some, um, but I, I think most of us um, feel quite quite passionate about um, cultural aspects and their connection to language teaching and, and that it isn't just grammar. Um, I think the one thing that really why I've chosen it is that I do have one problem with it. I think I think there's a, a bit there's a bit of an implication that we have, um, two very separate things here, and they're almost sort of polar, uh, polarized. So we have culture on the one hand, and we have language on the other hand. And I think that if we read this quote like that, um, then that's a, a little bit um, misleading, and, might, and we might be missing something along the way. So that's just a thought for starting off. Um, let's start. Let's start at the very beginning. Um, an obvious goal of, of of language learning is communication that's what we're we're in it for so the ability we're teaching the ability to understand and to be understood by other speakers of the new language um, and there is a very well-known model of communicative competence um, that that has done quite a lot to expand um, understanding of, of what that means to learn a language and what that means to be communicatively competent. It isn't just about putting the words together in the right order so that they make sense, um, which would be grammatical competence. It's also about, about word choices and sound choices and, and structure choices in a particular context and how, and the knowledge um, that the knowledge base that we have to interpret what what speakers of the new language are, are saying how do we, how do we know what they mean when they use those words and that's sociolinguistic competence um, how do we do how do we make it work when we don't know all the words um, how do we get through those language gap scenarios so strategic competence and then um, how, how do we make different sorts of speech acts and texts work successfully? So, so what are the features of those different types of communication? And that's discourse competence. Um, but there's a sibling concept as well, um, intercultural competence. And, and so um, the, the person's ability to relate to people who speak a different language um, and live in that in, and live in a different cultural context. And there, there are people that argue that that isn't, that isn't about communication in and through the language, um, that you can actually be culturally sensitive um, without knowing the language. Um, I, th I think that runs out pretty soon, if I'm honest. I, th I think that um, language is fairly essential if you want to have intercultural competence, um, but it isn't language on its own that gives you that. So that so our starting point is that we want to get all of this that's on this slide. We want to learn, and that's our aim when we teach people, when we teach our young people. Um, and a, and our really basic basic starting point is understanding ourselves as other or foreign to members of that uh, new culture and speakers of that new language. So it's that awareness. Um, that there is not just one way of seeing and describing the world, but that, um, and that our mother tongue is just one of one language among many other languages. Um, and I think that that, um, that growing knowledge, that sort of little light going on and then developing um, quite subtly over time is all bound up in the learning of new language words. The fact that table is just table to, to us because English is the language that, that we started speaking those of us that did, um, or whichever other language works as your mother tongue for you, um, but but that that is just a label and that there are many other labels that are equally valid. And so seeing the world differently is, is, what, is what we're really about, understanding and seeing, perceiving the world differently. So um, this is a world map, the like of which I never saw um, on, 
on my classroom wall when I was when I was going to school. In fact, it's quite an unusual word map. I'm not sure I've ever seen it in the flesh. Um, and I'm sure it would be quite easy for you to tell me which country you think it comes from. Um, this is actually from a, a classroom wall in China. And, you know, interestingly, in the word China, um, there's also a, a hint to this because the, the word is made up of two characters. Um, the, the first character, Zhong, is, means middle. Um, and here we can see China. You can see it faintly. It's the slightly darker blue. Um, right in the center of this world map, right in the center um, of this uh, projection of the world. And, you know, as most nations have done over the centuries, and even when they know that that's not actually geographically and physically true, still metaphorically um, believe that that's the case. Um, Chinese people believe that their empire was in the middle of the earth. And, don't, and haven't we all, um, haven't all nations done that since, since the beginning of time? Um, just realizing that there is isn't just one world map that there are um, different perspectives and we choose we we choose the projection that we want we choose the projection that's important to us this is this is an aspect of of culture that's mirrored in in lots of in lots of different ways including language um, and obviously let's see where the UK is on in this world vision see we're right over there you can hardly see us um, this is just this is just a starting point and a, and a sort of visual depiction if you like for for what for what learning a language does and right from the beginning it the core of it is that we're rejecting cultural supremacy if you like it's it's um, this is my all-time favorite statement in in any national curriculum not that I've read all the other subjects but any languages national curriculum and there have been several over over the last 25 years this is my all-time favorite statement learning a language is a liberation from insularity and provides an opening to other cultures. I think it's really helpful if we start from there, if we start from the fact that the process of learning a new language itself, of wrapping our heads around the fact that there are other words for things, is a step towards intercultural competence. Um, and recognizing that is, is helpful, I think, when we're considering trying to bring together in a slightly more holistic um, conceptualization what culture and language are and how they relate to each other. But let's think about what culture, what culture means in a bit more detail. So here's a really simple dictionary definition. Um, ideas, customs and social behavior of a particular society. It's not actually the easiest concept to define without leaving things out. Um, we can all say we can all say lots lots of lots of things about what culture is. Um, it includes ideas, it includes values, it includes attitudes, it includes ways of thinking, it includes ways of behaving. Um, I think when when we come to think about what we teach, it's a lot easier to give concrete examples of where to find it. Um, so we find it in customs, we find it in history, we find it in the geography, we find it in the traditions of a particular people um, or, or society, but maybe, maybe it's because it's quite dis difficult to grasp it all as a concept that, that, we, um, that we seize on those elements that, that occur sort of most readily to us. And those are the, the elements that kind of sit on top of the iceberg. So this, this um, really well-known iceberg model of culture um, is, is obviously really useful. It, it shows that there are both surface aspects of culture, the things we can easily perceive, and the deeper aspects underneath, um, and that are, they are connected. So one idea is, is that exposing learners to the elements on the top, the elements that they can grasp, the elements that they can perceive, touch, experience, um, paves the way for a better understanding for the belief systems underneath. Um, and it's, that's an idea that I, that I really like. But in, in this top um, layer of things that we can perceive um, is, is perhaps 
or I would argue anyway, <laughs> um, language that is the most visible and the most accessible expression of culture that there is, although its associations might not be so so red, readily and, and, and obviously there. But I really like this, um, what Claire Cramps has to say um, about, about it and, and, and the way she links some of these underneath elements. So common attitudes, beliefs and values are reflected in the way language is used. So what people, uh, speakers of that language choose to say, what they choose not to say and how they say things. Um, so I really, I really like that direct link there that she's, she's made between the, the, the top of the iceberg language with some of the things underneath. So uh, I, I do think that it's worth spending a little bit of time thinking about where we can find culture in language itself. So I, I think that there is um, culture in the sounds of the language. I think there's culture in the words, in the vocabulary, and I think there's culture also in the structures. And I think that when we teach those things, we, we open the way, we pave the way, we lay the foundation for understanding um, different ways of perceiving the world, um, different ways that um, different views of the world and we we also pave the way for seeing ourselves by direct contrast and comparison for seeing ourselves through the eyes of other people and um, teaching so this we're going to talk about phonics for a little bit teaching the sound symbol correspondence of the of the new language demystifies it allows students to read it aloud more confidently more accurately um, and a number of studies have have linked that to higher levels of of motivation um, more confidence in oral production so in speaking and also linked it to better vocabulary learning i also think that a comparison i'm not saying we spend a long time with it on this but a comparison with the sound writing relationship in english um, with all its complexities is a really powerful lesson in empathy with all those learning English. And, and there are plenty of people in this country in that position in our classrooms um, learning, learning English as well as learning Spanish, as well as learning German, as well as learning French. Um, and something that just you know, makes a little light bulb go off there um, and, and helps our learners to understand how how tricky English is in that respect is no bad thing. There's actually some evidence that learning a foreign language, um, you might become generally more empathetic um, as an individual. I quite, I quite like the fact that there's some research that says that there probably needs to be more before it's a, um, a completely universally held belief, but um, there is some. And Phonics teaching is really ideal for combining with cultural elements, some of those surface elements um, of culture. So uh, because in order to apply your phonics knowledge and develop it, get better at it, you need to apply it to unknown words. Um, there, there is no, there's, you don't get a lot from just reading aloud words that you already know because you already have those saved as vocabulary items in your head. So you're not necessarily applying the sound writing relationship. So you need to apply them to unknown words. And what unknown words can we choose? Well, any. Um, and so we get the opportunity to get familiar with the geography, with place names, um, with typical people names, with geographical features, iconic landmarks, and, and many other elements of, of popular surface culture, um, tongue twisters, uh, cognates, so that we're comparing um, many, many similar words that are found, are found in both languages, both, both English and the new language that we're learning. And obviously when you're reading aloud to develop fluency, um, you can include information about famous people, customs, festivals, songs. Um, and importantly, there are also sociolinguistic elements to, to phonics, which, which really excite me, actually. And I think it's about time that they, they found their way in in a slightly stronger way. So um, 
this is this is a starter activity, a phonic starter activity to a lesson that happens to be based around in and around the Bordensee and in particular Kreidslingen. But these these are all um, places around the lake in the three different countries. So we get, we get quite a clear visual representation. We see that this enormous lake um, actually is, is in the center of three countries or is surrounded by three countries, all of which are German speaking. So it gets, it gets all of our three main German speaking nations um, in the minds of pupils straight away. And here they, they, it's an audio activity. So they're just listening for the sound. Um, and, Kreuzlingen. and writing in the missing letters. Um, so this is a place names one. We, we're going to have to go quickly through resources to just give you a flavour after having made the, the point about, about phonics. But, but really anything um, in terms of unknown words, think about unknown words that can be read aloud or transcribed. Anything is up for grabs when you're developing phonics knowledge. So here we've got some some uh, people names, some of which look very, very similar um, to names in English, but will be pronounced differently or may be pronounced differently because of the sound writing relationship in French. So reading those aloud and then comparing um, to a native speaker pronunciation. And then a little bit of culture around games. We're still practicing phonics. We're still transcribing individual missing sounds. We're focusing on the sh, sh, and sh sounds in German here. Um, but getting to compare at the same time um, board games that we know um, that exist for us as well. So areas of, of cultural overlap, um, as well as a couple of differences. But, you know, in Interestingly, Germans got a really strong tradition of game creation. A lot of a lot of games were um, invented in Germany. Number four, for example, that we know as Ludo, um, actually started life as this Mensch ärgere dich nicht, and um, was designed by a, by a German. Um, and in 1907, so it's a really really old game. Settlers of Catan, which some of some of you will no doubt have played. I've certainly got that in my cupboard. Um, also designed by by a German um, speaking games designer. Anything? So just anything can we? We obviously want to to practice um, months here, but having it in the context of of a band on tour, working their way around um, the German speaking countries. These are real arenas that that are played in. So they're transcribing either the place or the date. Um, all, all of that is just getting, um, is just getting that familiarity with, with the target country, with the target language country. Here we're comparing French and English. Um, so English has two pronoun pronunciations for sh and, well, for ch, either sh and ch. Um, and there's a reason for that because the, where, where English and French pronunciations overlap, French just has one for sh. Um, so here we've got an example that French pronunciation is actually more straightforward than English pronunciation, a great, a great win for the classroom. Um, but there, the reason for that is that we've borrowed those words um, from French. So, so again, an activity that really raises the awareness, awareness about the, the um, interlanguage inter -language borrowing that there is. And all of all of these are obviously just short activities from a lesson. Um, very, I haven't changed this one, but obviously he's now no longer dirige al Gimnasia de la Plata, um, but um, uh, that is still currently in our resources because it hasn't been changed immediately. This is obviously what happens when you um, when you involve real people in your resources. But this was a um, actually a. a a read aloud activity, slightly longer to develop fluency, but focusing on the pronunciations of the ch and the chi sound. Um, again, there's always an interest in people that we've heard of, um, finding out where they come from and why we've heard of them is, is useful. Um, but here also we've got a link, obviously, with, with um, footballer, very, very famous in the past, with footballer who's very, very famous now, Sergio Aguero. Um, who who has a child with the 
with the daughter of Maradona, something that I didn't previously know before we researched it for this. Um, but there are, you know, there are, there's always a bit of cultural information in, in every, um, in everything you do when you, when you bring, um, when you bring facts, facts from the target country in, because at this point, um, we then realized that, that actually he is not he in this name. Diana is, is a, is an exception to the he, um, sound writing relationship because, and, and the, and the reason why is probably because 62% of, of Argentinians actually have Italian heritage. So, so have brought names with them that have been incorporated. It's not a hundred percent Italian pronunciation either, but it's definitely not, um, Spanish pronunciation. So, so just bringing in, um, elements of, of language shift over time as well, and and why and how heritage and and history um, have a bearing on on the way we pronounce things. I'm just going to quickly go through here. Um, obviously, reading aloud for fluency. These are all known words, so we're not pronouncing unknown words at this point. We're we're um, pronouncing words that we have met before, but combined in a different way. Um, but this this lesson is about Christmas in Spain. And, and has um, obviously has the Ubas um, tradition sort of incorporated within it. This is or Tannenbaum, one of the most famous German carols ever, um, used initially for phonics practice, and then the lesson goes on to, um, so the E and the I sound, but then the lesson goes on to look at an alternative version of the carol that was written by, by um, an an Austrian poet much, much later, um, and, a, and we do some comparative literature work on those. So just really showing at this point how much we can, how much we can do with phonics. Um, there's also the socio-cultural um, element that I mentioned, I think is really important though. So, so teaching um, fe and fi, I think most of, most of us looking at those would um, previously or would still pronounce those fe and fi, um, but raising awareness, for example, that of the pronunciation variation within the Spanish speaking world. Um, there are obviously a lot more um, Spanish speakers who would pronounce those two sounds se and si than there are um, who would pronounce them fe and fi. But up to this point, we've had quite a, a, a Euro, Eurocentric um, curriculum in many ways, and it is helpful um, in terms of when we're thinking about alternative perspectives, um, the the desire to to completely um, debunk notions of cultural supremacy that can be done through language. So here we're we're teaching um, se and si as being the pronunciation in the Canaries and in Latin America, um, and comparing the difference. So we have ciencias. And then we have ciencias um, and and building that, giving that lesson time, um, giving that lesson time because it sensitizes the ear. Um, but underlying that is is giving it lesson time um, because we're acknowledging that there are different variations of language that are equally valid, um, very widespread and and need to be learned. And it's important to to learn about them. So here we listen and we decide where the speaker is from. Doce. Ciencias. Decir. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, I'll move past this one because we've have had quite a lot of Spanish examples already. But um, so in Germany too, acknowledging that we have different ways of pronouncing key sounds and actually looking at those key sounds, um, something I've, I've, I'd never previously done in my teaching. So we have wichtig, fertig, wenig. But in the south of Germany and Austria and Switzerland, we have ich. So these words looking exactly the same. Wichtig, fertig, wenig. Um, okay, so that was a little bit about phonics. Now, culture in new language words, I, I think, again, vocabulary teaching should be equally culture rich and we, we can exploit every opportunity that there is um, to, teach, to teach the differences arising from geographical um, variants of the language, um, but also um, 
shining a light on formal and informal words for things. So obviously formal and informal register, that can be grammar, but that can also be vocabulary and lexis. Um, and, and every time we revisit vocabulary, which we know is really important to do, that we don't just see it once in one context, that every time we revisit, um, we can associate it with a different context. And that gives us the freedom to bring, to associate vocabulary with, with any, with with any cultural element, with anything at all, because we're not um, we're not tied in our vocabulary to particular topics. So therefore, we can associate them um, with other things that that cross more more broadly into different areas. Um, so here, for example, um, I, I know that previously in my teaching, I might have corrected um, en la mañana and and put a line through it and put por, but actually en la mañana is a perfectly valid alternative to por la mañana um, and is the one preferred in, in South American countries. So teaching pupils that, that there are alternatives and, and which alternatives are um, complete, completely correct and appropriate for them to use is an important aspect. Quick example of, um, of register. So you know, social convention is one aspect of culture that's really, really relevant to our to our learners. Um, and within that, the use of formal and informal ways of speaking as well as writing um, is about words and also about grammar. So here it's about words and it's about focusing on conversational language. Um, this example is focused on the use of three high frequency words that, that often serve as fillers um, and, and may not get the the classroom time that that they deserve um, but I think given that, given that we know the connection um, with motivation that students have with speaking the language sounding um, adopting ways of sounding like um, like real speakers of the language and being able to use it in a conversational way um, the these words are precisely those words that we should be giving some attention to so um, so here we're focusing on so. Deine Haare sind so toll. Um, all, all of the words, all of the words, obviously I've, I've taken this from a lesson. All of the words in here are, um, are known. Diese Aufgabe ist wirklich schwierig. So we're looking at combining them with these three um, conversational fillers. So here we go. Mia, dürfen wir das so machen? Nein, Wolfgang, so darfst du das nicht machen. And when, when you hear that, um, you, you're just immediately aware that that, that use of so is, is completely appropriate to context and, and means two different things. So so toll and so machen, um, same word, different, different meaning, different uses and something really, really worth practicing. Okay. Um, so formal and informal language. I don't. I don't know many year seven pupils that wouldn't have come across all of these during year seven. Um, but having an opportunity to to focus on them explicitly and and think about um, the context in which they were used. So again, we're talking about real socio cultural knowledge here. Um, is is just really nice. Okay. Um, so I, I was mentioning before that that um, that words that when we have a greater freedom to to select words out of topic um, silos um, and and then obviously we need a criterion um, you know NSUP would would say the frequency criterion is is a really important one words words selected and taught on the basis of frequency can really easily lend themselves to themes that go beyond familiar um, key stage three curriculum topics. So, so those words can combine in one way and then recombine in a completely different way on lots of aspects of life in other cultures. Um, and the danger with that has always been, and then we, this is where we get culture and language separating, is that when we launch ourselves into a, into a cultural focus, if we lose sight of 
well, what language is underpinning that? What language do they have to back that up and access this text or understand that, process that, the meaning from, from what we're sharing with them? If those things become then separated, um, we, we might be very excited about the cultural aspect that we're sharing, but if pupils don't have the knowledge of the words and structures to, to get right inside and grasp that, that knowledge and use it and be able to then express themselves on it, um, we might be losing something there. So it seems to me to be important to calibrate the readability and the language level um, of the material that we're giving, of the input we're giving, whether it's a song, whether it's a text, whatever it is, whether it's a video. Um, and I'm really excited because I, I, I have been doing this for the last two years by hand, individually looking up every word in a text to check that it's um, been taught already or glossing it if I want to include it and it hasn't been taught, of course, but doing, doing whatever I need to do to ensure that learners can actually access the text and then enter the Multilingue Profiler, which is an online free tool that you copy and paste your text into. Um, and it can tell me in, in a matter of seconds whether pupils have done all of, all of those words or not. So um, I wanted to do, and I, I wanted to do this activity, which I'd, I'd previously done without thinking about um, readability in particular, but um, sort of get, get at what is cultural, how does it differ from individual and what is universal in the world. So some quite interesting concepts, but can be done with simple language. And if we if we know how to to um, match it up with what students have already done um, without too much hard work, then all the better. So believe it for the for those of you who who are not Spanish teachers, believing that that snakes are bad is number one. Thinking that playing football is better than reading books, believing that it's the right thing to give a tip in a restaurant, eating and drinking regularly, loving genes, or thinking that older people are wise. So some statements for them to consider. So that's, that's a text, um, if you like, where students need to consider whether, um, whether it is a universal belief, a cultural belief, or an individual belief. So a matter of opinion. You can see when I when I bunged this very quickly into the profiler that it showed it showed me that students in year eight after one year and two terms, if they're following the NSUP scheme of work, have have covered all of the black words already um, and all of the structures inherent in them. Um, but they haven't learned the words universal, cultural or individual. But I am not going to gloss those because I would decide that those are um, cognates and transparent enough. Serpientes have, has not been taught. I would gloss that then to the side. Dar una propina en un restaurante. Obviously, restaurante I'm fine with. Propina I would gloss. Actually, a menudo has been taught, but it's 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 difficult to get that to. I think it has anyway. It's difficult to get that to recognize that in conjunction as a, as one single unit. I need to check that in the profiler. Vaqueros not taught would be glossed um, and mayor and sabia which inevitably will be taught um, in the next couple of years but haven't yet been taught i would gloss or i would decide to change depending on on how many words i wanted to gloss here so um having a having a way of um this is just an example about of really taking any text that can be um, useful culturally and lead to really, really fruitful thinking and exciting thoughts. So this could be, it could be on um, La Tomatina, a text on La Tomatina, but knowing that the percentage of words known, the readability is high and tweaking the text to make sure that it lies within um, students' reach in terms of their understanding. That That is how um, integrating language and culture sort of works on an actual pragmatic functional level um, without you having to spend an hour and a half looking up every single word. Um, so that that is a tool that I really recommend. Um, and I'm really going to whisk through now because I know I must be um, running out of time. But it does mean that every time you revise vocabulary in this text, we're revising the words along the bottom. Um, we can revise those in different themes. This happens to be um, the Wurstel Prate, where I went with Eva Lamb. It was such fun. Um, 
but it's all of the language of this whole lesson um, is to do with this theme park. Um, and this is an, another example. This is this is the the whole tradition of going on Klassenfahrt in Deutschland, which is which is very different from a school trip that different people from different classes opt into. This is the whole class travels together um, and we listen and and translate these sentences. So so um, that all of the words are are known, but they are being recycled and um, translated. So we're doing a listening comprehension, but we're also learning about this particular tradition of the school system in Germany. Um, another one on the school system in Germany, a newspaper article, etc. Um, I'm giving a flavour really of, of how much culture can come into words when the words aren't um, aren't tied down into particular topic boundaries that sometimes sort of um, stop us from seeing how much culture we could get in and sometimes they they make us see cultural lessons as separate from our topic lessons but really culture can come into any lesson um, and a quick a quick whisk through and a look through culture in grammar um, and I've put the, that really well-known quote um, from Goethe up there, because it's it's really important for what well, I think. So it it alludes to this real the the power of comparison um, for learning, and I think um, the process of learning a new way to describe really common things or express really familiar ideas makes the language learner reflect more consciously on on their own language. Um, one that they would otherwise take for granted and not think about at all because they'd be using it much more automatically and comparing and contrasting the two languages really enhances awareness and better knowledge of both. Um, and, you know, one one example is is where you compare the existence of the two verbs to be in Spanish. Who who would who would pause for any moment at all to reflect that English just has one way to describe being and existence, except a learner of Spanish. Unless you knew that there, there were other languages that did it differently, you would not reflect that, that that's maybe a limitation of your own language or it's a difference anyway, um, that you just have one way to describe existence. And you know, which, which English learners who, who haven't yet learned any foreign language consider grammatical gender as a thing it's it's only it's only learners of of French, German, and Spanish that will suddenly, and also REAL learners um, as well. But in the classroom scenario, it's only it's only those learners who will start suddenly thinking, "Oh, gender, we don't have that." Um, grammar features, in the same way as vocabulary, combine amazingly well with any cultural context you can think of. Um, so the formal and informal language, um, your loose theme there can be staying with a family. Um, plural nouns can combine with anything, but here, the only reason I've put suggestions, concrete suggestions in the brackets is because these are the ones that we've created resources for. Could be anything, plural nouns can go anywhere, could be anything, um, anything cultural at all. But all of these are grammar features that we would teach and all of the bits in brackets are cultural associations and cultural contexts that we can teach them in and through. Um, so word order is where, I, is where I used the Austrian theme park, comparatives, geographical features, cities, comparing them then, comparing how they've changed now um, and, and prepositions in a poem. I'm just going to whiz through those examples because um, if you are interested, you can find them in the resources. You can always ping me an email, but I'm going to rush through now. So, so teaching, teaching the, the features that we need for formal modes of address. Now, this is in the national curriculum. Um, this is from a year eight lesson. It feels, it feels important to teach it. I, I wasn't actually putting much time into teaching it before, um, mainly because the GCSE didn't require it because because it found a way of the in the role plays of always 
meaning you didn't have to produce it, you sometimes had to understand it, but you could use other clues to understand it. Um, but here we spend some, some time um, focusing on it. Um, actually, this, this, our exchange student here, Andrea, who's from Cambridge, is interacting with either one of these people. We need to listen and decide who she's talking to. Has eine Katze? And the reason that there's a, a bleep out of the pronoun and we can't hear it is because we're a very pronoun driven um, language set of la language learners. The, if, you are a, if you are an L1 English speaker, you, you put all of your um, understanding power into the pronoun itself. And that, and that enables you to sideline, sidestep rather the verb endings you're not why would you focus on the verb endings we don't have them in english except for the s so we focus on the thing that always gives us the information which is the pronoun which means that that pupils tend to know what the word is for you but they don't always know which ending it goes with so here um, we've we've taken away the, the easier clue in order to direct all of the learning power and all of the attention um, onto what's missing Sind müde? So here you can only know who who's being talked to um, by knowing that that uh, by knowing the form of the verb. And here again, haben schon gegessen. So moving on. Um, again, this obviously is important in French too. Um, looking at informality and formality. S'il vous. I'm I'm going. Um, And, and a really nice, I think, I put this in for, for this slide, actually, in particular, a really nice awareness raising exercise, drawing um, out the cross linguistic difficult, uh, differences in the expression of formality. So can we tell, this is in English, you're a careful woman, you're an ambitious man, you're hardworking people, can we tell whether we're, we're talking formally or informally? No, we can't tell in any of these scenarios. You might be able to tell from a tone of voice. You might be able to tell if you could see who's talking. Um, there might be some gestural, there might be, it might be proximity and how, how you're talking to them, more likely tone of voice. But in French, you get that information right up front in the words themselves. Um, and and that, that's cultural information attached to grammatical structures, in my view. Okay, so, um, Yeah, this was the one about, about plural forms connected with Christmas. Um, here we've got some comparatives connected with the German song, different ways of forming plurals connected with the same song. Um, moving on, um, comparatives, different elements of different countries, geographical features that we're talking about, rivers, lengths of rivers, sizes of towns here we're talking about Salzburg um, all of the information here is stuff is stuff that they need to know um, or well they need they don't need to know it but stuff that it's um, interesting and useful to know about the places if, of the countries that they are um, of the people who speak that language in the countries that they you know what I mean target language countries um, rushing 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 now um, but it is possible to do all of these things and still keep the level of the language just just so, just right, just um, in, in terms of um, readability and um, comprehensibility where the learners need it to be in order that a culture lesson doesn't suddenly jump them out of language. It keeps them really rooted in the, in the progression of the language. Something that's really quite important because we only have two periods a week um, and at the end of the day, the, the exam at the end of the day will, will test their communicative competence. Um, we want them to have intercultural competence at the same time, and we believe it's part of the same thing. But at the end of the day, they will be tested on, on the words they know and how those words get combined. Um, more things there. So um, just a very quick um, summary. How, how do we ensure that, that um, when we're teaching language, we're teaching more than words and grammar? Um, well, we teach 
the culture we recognize, I think, and acknowledge and teach the culture that's inherent in the language itself and, and recognize that we are teaching culture when we do that. I think that's really helpful. Um, we use every opportunity to build knowledge about countries and peoples um, and for want of a better word, using a principled approach. So, so still keeping it rooted in, in, in the knowledge and in the knowledge that they have and in the knowledge that we're trying to help them develop so that there's not an abrupt change of gear when we suddenly go into um, what we consider a cultural lesson. And then of course, the bit that lies mostly outside of, of what we can talk about today, exploiting the power of personal encounter, which whether real or virtual, we're doing a lot of things virtually these days. Um, we, we know that in terms of becoming interculturally more more open and more sensitive um, and also from the linguistic side of things being able to understand more and interact more and communicate better um, the power of personal encounter um, cannot cannot be overestimated and in this is my moment to just um, tell you a little bit about about connecting up with Peru um, and you know as Helen said, that, that was my major motivation in, in doing this webinar. Um, we're having a terrible time in lockdown, but we also um, you know, are doubtless aware that, that other countries um, don't, have, don't have an NHS, don't have an infrastructure, don't have people that have jobs that can be done at home, um, are, are very much 70% of the Peruvian economy is um, is informal, as they call it, which which means you know you don't turn up, you don't get paid. It's it's hand to mouth, it's cash in hand, um, and so a lot of people were unable to access even the 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 quite generous at the start government handouts. Um, they just didn't have a bank account that that money could go in, and and so there was there was no way of of them staying at home, and that's why they continued to go to work, and that's why the um, rate of infections got so high. And they've been. Uh, they're probably outpacing us for deaths, although they're not being acknowledged because, um, again, then they're, they're just not being diagnosed. But there are about 80 percent higher deaths than would be normal at, at this stage in an average year. And I think that's the, be the best re uh, the best way of trying to um, calculate the, the impact on the country. Obviously, children um, without parents and children who are who are living in homes have got a particular um, challenge when I started this um, appeal um, for for the school for sorry for the orphanages that that were a, um, a link through an exchange link we used to visit when we were actually going over to Peru which we temporarily put on hold um, it was an exchange link um, that we visited and we did some some fundraising for them as a school um, but when I started this, they had 65 or 64 children. I can't remember what I've put on the link, but now that's gone up to, to 72. Um, and, and just to, to show from a personal point of view how, um, how personal encounters can start off as something that's part of your education. So this was part of my commitment to um, increasing the educational opportunities for students in my school. Um, this is now very much a part of my life. These are these are people I know um, who I consider as close friends, as family essentially, and and whose well-being I take I take really seriously. Um, and I wanted to do something. So 72 children and rising. And the reason that the numbers are rising is obviously due to COVID. The children are are coming in um, as their parents are are succumbing to the disease. I wanted to find a way to contribute to their education as well, um, rather than just send them money for subsistence. I wanted to think what I could try and set up to help their education, which is not, which is being very badly neglected in state schools. Um, super duper private schools are doing really well, but but state schools are really struggling. Um, these 72 children have eight mobile phones between them, and that's how they access their learning. Um, through a mixture of things like WhatsApp, I've been told is how it's going at the moment. So I was really desperate to find something and enter, um, enter connect and a lang and I heard, I, I think I found out about this on Twitter. Um, Dave, uh, David must have put out a tweet about the language ambassador program from Sanico, which is, which is where they are 
um, giving licenses to teachers of, of certain countries in Latin, in Latin America predominantly um, to help more people get language skills and improve their life chances. And that's, um, and I wanted a bit of that action. So um, I have now um, started putting together a few exercises um, very tentatively. Um, I can say that I kind of know how to use this now. Um, I'm, I made a phonics exercise based on English pronunciation patterns, um, based on Christmas vocabulary as well for, for some pupils to do. Um, and because I didn't trust myself to go out of this PowerPoint and onto the internet, um, I, I just did a screenshot of what it looks like. Um, but I'm, I'm beginning to get students in trialing now um, these exercises. And what's really, really brilliant is, is the oral interaction that's possible through here. So I'm, I'm going to ask David to start sharing his screen now and just show you a little bit better than I can tell you a little bit better than I can because I'm really a novice um, but I've got some teachers over there that I'm attempting to share with and train in using this so David if you want to um, request a screen share hello everybody I hope everybody can hear me see me yes, yes we can I'll take that as a yes thank you uh, yeah, firstly, uh, my name's uh, David Binns. I'm the, well, I, the bloke from the north. That's what I am. I'm sat in Leeds. So hopefully everybody will be okay with my accent. Um, it is quite pronounced, I'm reliably informed. <laughs> um, but I'm really involved for a couple of reasons. Once, because I believe in this project that Rachel's handling. Um, I've seen that those children need as much help as they can get. So we're behind Rachel and doing what we can. Um, the other reason for me doing this quick talk presentation, if you like, is to give Rachel a chance to rest from talking. She's been talking solidly for a while now. Um, so this is just a little... Hmm. We seem to have lost David. I wonder whether perhaps we give it a minute and then you've got a little bit more you're going to do, have you, Rachel? I have. So it could be that we bring him in later. If you can be ready to take over. Yes. Because we've got to see his bit. He's got, I've um, seen these. Oh, oh, is he back? Ooh. Oh. Oh. Oh, there he goes. No, now you're, now you're in the, all right. Right. Come back. Let's try again. <laughs> Let's try again. Okay, can you still see my screen? No. No. Just a moment. Technology, eh? <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible thing. Okay, let's try again. Am I back? Yes, you are. Right, wonderful. So you're not in the slideshow. Oh, yes, you're about to do it. Good. Right, so we'll start from this slide. Everybody in the UK knows us for our language labs. There's thousands and thousands of them around the UK, um, which are fantastic within a classroom. They use for all kinds of things from independent study, group oral assessment, pair work. These things are usually networked around the classroom or around the school, which is fine. Uh, did everybody hear why I said about Zoom and Teams? We're not no. competing. Well, we're not trying to compete with Zoom or Teams or Google. This is a product designed specifically for MFL teachers. There are some things which Teams and Zoom do better than our products. And by the same argument, there are some things which our products do better than Zoom or Teams. It's designed specifically for the MFL teacher. So the idea is we wanted to take this synchronous and asynchronous learning technology online. So we developed essentially various products. Uh, the first one being something called Pronounce Live, uh, very popular product, online, easy to use. But it's the Sanico Connect that Rachel's using. It's online. Something to think about is it is GDPR compliant, so you don't need to worry about who's seeing it, who's sharing what. As far as we're concerned, the students are anonymous. We have no idea. 
So some of the things it can do, we can do role playing across the internet. Uh, we can do group discussions. We call it pass the mic. Automatic voice insert is great for oral ass assessment practice. Many, many universities in the UK now are using it for interpreter training and translation. We can do vocab testing. The two track recording facilities, something people find very useful because it allows you to dub an audio track onto another audio track, question and answer, or onto videos, of course. We can add subtitles, audio and gap filling text exercises. There are so many things we can do. Uh, these images are from a school in Wales, and I must say, it's a very, very good school. They're doing really well. It's just a state school, limited budget. They're doing fantastically well. So with Sanoco Connect, in its what we call the asynchronous mode, let's assume Rachel's sat here in the UK. Apologies if there's anybody from Wales, but she's wiping out most of Wales at the moment. I do apologize for that. Uh, and as we can see, Rachel has taken to wearing a shirt and tie. Mm. It's the way she teaches, I believe. And she, there's obviously a time difference between the UK and Peru. So the first thing Rachel may want to do is upload exercises into the cloud, like the one she's just shown you. From there, Rachel uploads the exercises. Students can download them. And one of the unique things is once they've completed their work, they click submit and the work is automatically sent back to Rachel. And this is purely because of the time difference. Yes, we have schools in the UK using the same technology and doing the same thing, but what we've found is not all students are online at the same time when they're at home. So just popping it up there and leaving it for them to use when they're ready makes a big difference. It just makes life easier. There are all kinds of things we can do from embedding audio, video files, web pages, YouTubes, lots and lots of things. And everything is automated. We can do also the written exercises. We have different types of recorder depending on the exercise. Uh, there's a school in Manchester who use it an awful lot for essentially online oral assessments with a live teacher. It's simple. Like everything online, Examinations can be challenging because you have no controlled environment, but the technology works. And then of course we can move on to the, the synchronous mode. All the same activities, Rachel is still sitting on top of Wales. We can still connect things to the cloud. We can upload, download, and students can submit their work. But Given the time difference and knowing Rachel as I do, she probably is up at two o'clock in the morning teaching the students in South America. And we can have live two way audio communication. We can listen to students, offer live support instantly. We can do oral assessment work, group discussions, all kinds of things. So it's, it's a combination of systems. It's designed to work with our existing languages technology. Uh, your language lab in your classroom. Um, I've seen some names come up on the list, many of which I recognise as our customers. Um, it's designed to complement what you already have. And it's, I'm an old fashioned realist. I, I've worked at Sanico for over 40 years now. And we see lots of buzzwords come along. Um, and I'm a great believer in just buy the technology that you need and that will help you. These online systems will never replace your locally installed systems because you have to wait for a server that can be in South America, Los Angeles, in our case, Helsinki, because we're a Finnish company. Everything takes a little bit longer online. So it's designed to form a blended learning system along with your existing technology. So that's, that's just, I don't want to make this into a sales thing because it, it is very, very much about Peru uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, so that's how it works. Thank you for listening to me. Um, if you do have any questions, I'll be around after the webinar's finished. Just send them through. Alternatively, my email address is there. Um, please feel free to email me personally. What I would like to say, I didn't notice if there were any schools in Leeds. Uh, I'm looking for a state school in Leeds. If somebody would like to give me a call, uh, you'll find it very interesting. Um, Anyway, so that's me. So thank you, Rachel.
Hope you've had a chance to have a rest and get a cup of coffee now. So back to you. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so, well, um, there was a lot of love for your accent, David, I have to say. <laughs> uh, some love for Connect as well, but quite a lot of, quite a lot of comments about, about your accent. Uh, for some people, obviously, bringing back some very fond memories of Leeds, too. Um, okay, so, I'm aware of time, but I'm also aware of having um, promised something about cultural capital as well as, well as culture. Um, and so just not not quite as many thoughts on this but a few thoughts on it um it it's obviously one of those things that that was a bit of a buzz um a buzzword ofsted um has it in their handbook um, and describes it in those terms essential knowledge that you need to be an educated system uh, an educated system an educated citizen not a system um introducing you to the best that's been taught and said now um it, that's that's sort of quite vague and I think that it's it it's worth kind of um understanding where that really comes from um and the ideas that that are under it and 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 I think we probably do now because it's been out in the in the offset handbook for a while and we obviously dissect and analyze everything that's that's in there um in schools but so for what it's worth my understanding of this is is that it's basically saying all curriculum subjects should be aiming to narrow the gap between the children that come from more affluent backgrounds who might, and I say might because it's a gross generalization and there are families of all kinds, but who might sit down in the evening to eat dinner um, with parents who talk to them and read newspapers and comment on, on stuff that's going on, might do crosswords, et cetera, um, and who might therefore sort of imbibe from all around them all bits, all sorts of bits of knowledge um, that they're not even aware of that range from general world knowledge to sort of higher level vocabulary, um, just, you know, posher words for stuff. And, and so they might just end up knowing, knowing more words, knowing more things about the world in general and, and sort of being a bit more savvy about how to interact within it and how to, uh, how to make um, the best of all the opportunities that life has to offer. And so we're, we're about narrowing the gap between those, those students um, and everyone else who doesn't have those advantages. Um, I mean, other people have, have some, some more recent work has tried to sort of um, extend the idea of cultural capital and, and sort of define it a little bit better. So, so um, going on for the original Bourdieu's work had, had, which was the original sort of source for the term cultural capital had had um, these forms of knowledge in there. So cultural goods, books, works of art. So sort of literature, music, all of those sorts of things. Um, embodied knowledge. So what's in language, what's in mannerisms, what's in preferences for particular words, I guess. Um, and institutionalized knowledge, which are your what, what you leave school with. But then in Additionally, other people have added these ca categories. So they're, they're talking about technical knowledge or emotional knowledge and that word empathy um, came up there again. And, and, and I thought that was, that was interesting. And then subcultural knowledge, um, a, partic a particular knowledge of, of um, and behaviors that belong to particular groups. So again, we can, we can begin to immediately see the resonances that, 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 that there is within a, within a language education that does some of the things that I was um, describing before we, before we looked at Connect. Um, obviously the national knowledge, knowledge of traditions, high and popular culture that generate that sense of belonging. But, but let's not forget what Goethe said about only knowing your own when you when you have an experience of the other and the fact that that not only are we teaching other awareness but we're also shining a, a spotlight on on how how our culture traditions customs feelings beliefs um, fit and are situated within within many other um, ways of viewing the world so um, I think there's a direct relevance of of what I was all of the elements that have been in the first part of this presentation and this now cultural capital but um 
I think to try and narrow it down just a little bit and, and define it a bit, um, we might be looking at sort of general knowledge. So the things that sort of people would would not rely on school to get necessarily if they're in these more affluent backgrounds um, where um, things are where there's a lot of talk at home, maybe um, wider vocabulary. So including a sort of more sophisticated register, cross linguistic knowledge um, that that we're able to provide in, in language teaching and language education. Um, some knowledge of the best thinkers, scientists, writers from around the world. So, so um, definitely including those big thinkers who have contributed to um, to world knowledge. And then, and then this going back to this issue of different ways of of seeing and defining the world, enriching you and making you um, more able to take your your place in society. So, I think we do all of these things. Um, I've tried to <laughs> tried to encapsulate them in just a few examples, but. Um, I, my my first example is a bit weird, and and it's um, I've chosen it. I, basically, um, my mum's living with me now and has been for the last three months, and she likes the chase, so she watches it a lot. And obviously, um, I sit with her and watch it sometimes too. And these are some of the questions that have come up in the num the zillion episodes that we've watched. Um, and I picked on these particular ones for reasons that will become obvious, but it, but it's this sort of thing. Um, you know, lots of people rock up to the chase from all walks of life. Um, and these were some of the questions that, that were asked that I happen to know the answers to only because of my involvement in language education. So what does the Latin word Felix mean? Those were the three options. Um, and a year seven pupil would know that in Spanish, not necessarily in any other language, but if they'd learned Spanish, they would. Um, where's the Black Forest? If you study German um, and are following the NSAP scheme of work, you'd also know the answer to that question. To the nearest million, what's the population of Berlin? You would also know the answer to that question. And bizarrely, which of these sleeps the most? You'd also know the answer to that because we happen to have a text um, on, on facts about animals. So this is where you'd you'd have learned the the information about Germany, uh, about the Black Forest. I'm going to whiz through. This is where um, Berlin would have come up. This is where the animal facts would have come up. Um, and you know, obviously, there are a zillion other examples. But if we're teaching real things from the real world, um, you know, did you know that there were 550 types of wild bee in Germany? Uh, you may think that you could live your life without knowing that, but but it it is it is a sort of a rich um, tapestry of detail about life that that is um, that is what we can offer in our in our subject alongside this principled approach to to language. Um, beautiful, if you if you were not aware of this, there is. Um, a natural phenomenon, which is a which is the Rainbow River, um, a Rainbow River in in Colombia, and because of the particular um, ingredients, that's not the right word, but components of the rock at certain times of year, um, the, it, there are about seven um, seven colours visible in this particular um, place. So I anyway, I'm going to to go through. I think it's. I've got way too many examples to to make the point, but um, I I think that um, moving on then from from those sorts of details, there is there is another um, there is another element that we can claim I think as as something that our subject does. Um, so the the background to this um, this slide is is that countries have been so keen to learn English that English language teaching abroad, I'm sure you're aware of this, has become an absolute billion pound industry, a, a, a massive industry. Um, and, you know, many native English speakers um, just kind of off the street, if you like, just because of their native um, use of the language have, have found it very easy to get work teaching English to foreign students abroad. Um, but over time, people are realizing that just because you are a native speaker of English, it doesn't necessarily mean you can successfully teach your language. And, and here I'm not really talking about um, 
the pedagogy of preparing a lesson. I'm talking about the the perspectives that you have if you are multilingual that make you a better teacher of your own native language as well. Um, and why would that be? I mean, some of the things that we've we've thought about already, you you would have more understanding and more empathy for the difficulties that a learner would be having and could be having. You may also be a much more attentive listener because of the um, effort that you have needed to put in and you continue to need to put in as a language learner yourself. Um, you also may be very used to um, that, that strategic competence angle of puzzling out meaning when not every word is absolutely clear because you don't know every other word. And you may be very adept at simplifying your own use of language, avoiding avoiding slang and avoiding idioms. And I, I've heard, I'm sure we all have heard and overheard conversations where non-multilingual people have, have been trying to, to talk in English to, to non-native speakers of the language, to learners of the language, and, and just throw in the most unbelievable number of, of obscure um, idiomatic ways of saying things and slang um, that totally confuse the person that's listening. But that's just because not being a language learner yourself, you haven't got that sensitivity to language use and what, what could be understood. So instead of saying this, and I think this could be a really, really useful um, activity to do with students, for example, when you tell them in an assembly, in a lesson, on a PD day, so personal development day, PSHE, whatever everyone calls it, um, we call it PD now, but tell them that as a language learner, you are uniquely and, and best placed to have empathy for, for other learners of languages, including your own language, your L1, um, if you are an English speaker, and, and ask them what they would say instead of using idioms. So some some words have exact equivalents tell them what idioms are others don't etc etc because they're culturally specific um he's feeling a bit under the weather today you know that could only be an english expression really couldn't it because so in other countries you know weather is not ever inclement and so talking about that as being associated with with feeling unwell would would not be immediately um understandable to people so these sorts of idioms that we could give them and then ask them how, how they would actually say that to get at the meaning if they were talking to someone who wasn't a first language speaker of English. Um, and I think, you know, there's another, that's a really, really concrete example of, of getting at that idea that there are, um, that the way to learn about your own language is to learn a foreign language. And the way to be a better communicator in your own language is to learn a foreign language because you are able to communicate with all kinds of um, with all kinds of speakers of English, and we know that there are a zillion of those. Um, how do we communicate best with them? Well, by understanding what are the sorts of things that they might not understand. Um, obviously, an, another way of playing with words is is and seeing language as a reflection of culture and a reflection of ideas is is to bring some really um, lovely, interesting words to your students. And no, these aren't high frequency <laughs> words, but there's a place for everything. And and you know, not I'm not putting these on a curriculum for them to learn, and I'm not going to give them a vocab test on them the week after. But for personal enrichment experience choosing a favorite word and in the language is is a fun thing to do finding out about some ideas behind particular, particular words, words is a is, is a, a fun is thing a fun to do. do i've started hearing myself twice now twice. I, hope, I, hope, I hope i hope you're not you're all not. hearing me twice um and then just a, a, a couple more quick ideas um the a, a comparison task of, of idioms using parts of the body, and of course it could be idioms using food, idioms using anything. Um, you know, are these are these the same in each language, or are they similar, or are they completely different? Um, I'm not suggesting that we we put for our learners of Spanish, we also put French and German up. Obviously, you could you can edit out languages you're not you're not doing, but just just to demonstrate the idea of 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 comparison of cultural comparison um you know idioms are, are a great sort of little window on on ways of perceiving the world um and so here 
you're pulling my leg in Spanish, you're taking my hair. Um, tu me fais marcher. Or du nimmst mich auf den Arm. Which is, a, which is an interesting, you know, why that part of the body, there may not be a reason why, it's not that we're going to, to say the German people are much more into arms than, than English people who are into legs, but just interesting to, to shine a light on language, the intrinsic interest in language, it is, you know, language is exciting. Obviously, all of these, the second one, are all exactly the same, essentially they're word for word translations. Why is that? Again, asking pupils to think about why that might be. Do they recognize that? They probably don't. They probably don't have a good understanding or a good knowledge of the Old Testament, but um, they may have heard of it. They may think it's from the Bible. They may make a connection and say, well, okay, so that, that goes back. And originally then the Bible was translated into all of those languages. So, so that's, why that, um, that's why that idea is, is kind of more um, universally spread across different cultures. Other ones, other ones, other ones. You get the idea. Um, if if you liked any of those ideas, in in including the sort of the universal, the cultural, and the individual one, um, you will find them and a lot more um, in a series that I put together called called Motivation and Ad Advocacy. Um, the links here. So if you download the slides. Um, on Monday or whatever, you could just click this link and it will take you to six um, sets of PowerPoint slides and, and within each area. So there's there's a session on identity, there's a session on language, um, a session on perspectives. And that's where I got the Chinese world map out of that to share with you. Creativity and codes, global nation, global you and future you. All different aspects of raising awareness um, about the richness of, of, of language, but tying it together with, with um, different things. Some of them are language activities. Some of them are awareness raising activities and have multiple languages in them. So they're not French, German, Spanish. They've got lots of different languages in them so that students can perceive the links um, between them. But I, I wrote them for anything. So individual activities that could be slotted into a lesson. You could take one slide. Um, alternatively, they could make um, a day, a part day off timetable. They could be used as homework. They could be used as assemblies. They're quite versatile, um, but essentially there's a there's a lot of culture in there. Um, and I think that that is probably me having rabbited around um, the houses enough. Um, so, I mean, I think at the end of the day, Language, language education does does many, 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 many things. But I think if you were to sum it up, if someone says, well, what is the point of foreign language education within a curriculum? You'd have to say that the unique contribution that language learning makes is to teach us to see the world differently, to be a cure for cultural color blindness, um, to give the value of a second or a third lens so that we can see life through um, different people's eyes, people who experience life in, in a different country and grow, grow up in a different place. And not just to accept that, not to, not, it's not tolerance that we're after. And it's not tolerance that, that I think we need to be visioning when we, when we teach. It's, it's, it's relishing, it's sort of appreciating, but with excitement. I mean, relish is a bit too much like what you put on your burgers, but um, that's the only word I could think of when I was trying to think, relish the fact that there isn't just one way um, to do or see or experience things. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm coming from with with culture, really. And I'll finish with with this. Um, this, <laughs> this is where I'm at at the moment. Um, and thank you to all of you um, who have already um, been on there because um, I could tell by messages that some people were connecting it with this with this seminar um, and so a webinar rather and thank you to any, anyone who has um, given anything at all um, I know I feel I feel slightly bad I've always felt awkward um, about asking for money but I don't feel that awkward because they're important to me and they need it so um, so please please consider it um, and that's my next session.
next week. Um, there is quite a lot of culture in the next session as well. I have to say that I had to cut out big whole culture lessons that I was also going to talk through um, yeah. I, and show you and share with you, but I've cut them um, and had to put them into meaningful practice because it obviously is all associated with meaningful practice too. So we will look at in that session next week, we're gonna look at two things, how to make every moment of the lesson count in terms of practice that promotes language learning. So, you know, right across um, listening, speaking, reading, writing, but also how to make the most of texts and do extended practice using one sort of text or one input, could be one song across one or two lessons for the week. Um, so looking in depth at, at two or three weeks of resources. So at least one French, at least one German, and at least one Spanish um, to look at to look at that. So that's that's next week. And thank you very much. And back to you, Helen, I think. Well, just thank you so much, Rachel. Um, you'll, you won't be able to see all of the chat, but you'll really enjoy reading it. You will see just how much everybody enjoyed it. Lots and lots of comments and lot, it's just flooding in now as well. And I think this is where it's so nice that you'll be able to see it afterwards. We will paste all of the chat onto the um, web page that we'll put so that everybody can see that because you'll find that not only have you given us loads of information you've sparked off such a lot of interest to begin with people being interested in the things that you raise because you know we don't always know everything about the culture of the language that we're teaching anyway so we, there's mm. been discussions there people have been sharing loads we've got People like Danielle Bourdieu, who I know does loads on culture there, has been sharing things. Stephen, who's done a lot with the BBC, lots of other people sharing things. So thank you for what you've Great. contributed. Thank you for sparking off the interest. Um, and I didn't notice anything which were, you know, people were really asking questions which often other people would, would answer in the chat. So if there's anybody who's got a burning, burning question, by all means, perhaps put it, put it in the chat now. But I think that really, um, just thank you so much. Um, could I really also reiterate, I know that Rachel was saying about being a bit embarrassed about asking for money, please don't be embarrassed and please, please, could people just click on that link, it's ever so easy if you haven't done it before, and also you get the option of being able to give extra money, what's it called, to do with tax and so you can get, they can get money back from it, so it really does add an awful lot if you can do that, so. Um, so I don't know if there's anybody else who wants to say anything, I thought what I'd do, I, I've just put into the chat the link, it's gone a long time below now because so many people have been saying thank you, but um, there's a link for next week. So it'd be lovely to see people there. And also the sort of chat that we've been having while you've been giving us this, you've inspired us. Next Saturday evening, so you've got your talk 3.30 to five o'clock. In the evening, AWR London had already said that we'd have a, a Christmas party, but we hadn't decided what to do in that Christmas party. You have given so many ideas. Helen McFarlane is on fire here in direct mass messaging, giving me all sorts of ideas. And one thing that she said was, well, couldn't we ask people to introduce a, a Christmas song from, uh, you know, from the country they, they, um, whose, whose language they teach? And then, Helen, I don't know if you want to come on, but you were just saying about perhaps we could then have a pick and mix of activities. So perhaps people could think about activities which we could do. And there's Stephen who's showing his that anyway, what I'd really like you to do as well is if anybody who's here, please, could you put up, if you don't mind showing your face, it would be lovely to take a picture of people. Yeah, I you. might see everybody. I, I, I tried to look more professional without my Paris sweatshirt. I'm gonna. <laughs> okay, well, that's lovely to see people. So perhaps we can have a real, I, I'll, um, I'll take photos, we'll do lots of thanks. And then anybody who wants to sort of stay and just have a little chat about Helen's ideas or anything else to, to Rachel, you can do that. Yes, Rosie, you're looking great there. So you're adjusting, your, adjusting your hair. I'm, lo I'm loving the idea of, of, of the party, as in let's get, yeah. some, let's get some cultural stuff happening at this party. Well, it would actually be really, I mean, there are so many things that we don't, that we don't know about, about the cultures of the language that we're teaching that we could either share one thing or we could also, you know, we could go into... I don't know different rooms and have a pick we could have a pick a mix we could we could do like speed dating but you share one cultural thing what not real but, dating well <laughs> we can't we can't kiss and hug can we at this minute 
<laughs> more's, the, more's the pity. By the way, I'm taking pictures while you're talking and people could perhaps write in the chat any ideas that you've got for our pick and mix, which we've just decided about. So I'm sure that Stephen will have ideas about biscuits, biscuits around the world, yes? Definitely, yes. That's his latest. <laughs> the world biscuit. We worked out which, what was the best biscuit in this country, Stephen? What was uh, the answer? Yesterday evening with the group we had, the, the world's champion biscuit was the rich tea because it is so flexible. And we, I look at Margaret's face there, she doesn't like them at all. <laughs> we were hearing from Veronica, who's from southern Spain, that with a rich tea, with what they call, they call the Maria in Spain, but it's basically the same biscuit, you can make delicious cakes with chocolate and flan. So there you are, you don't just have to have the plain biscuit, you can do things with it. But isn't it interesting though, that that I know, I, I think you're right, that it is sort of the same biscuit, but for me, the Maria is so much more delicious than a rich tea. And, and that might be just because I'm predisposed to love everything Spanish. <laughs> so it tastes better in my mouth because I want it to taste better because I, it's Spanish and therefore I'm going to love it. Whereas, you know, boring old English rich tea, who's going to love that? that? That's like how we bring our own perceptions to bear, even on our taste buds. Well, that's it. That's Margaret, I have to just say, I, had, I was just taking a picture of everybody as you mentioned that and poor Margaret your face <laughs> I did take another one because it really was expressing them uh, there are lots of had great feelings about that Margaret <laughs> not, not to... oh we can't hear you Margaret I think you've unmuted yourself but I can't hear somehow it, it, try it, again. Didn't, it didn't come it didn't come through no but there are lots of calls for Stephen to write a multilingual song. So I hope you're not busy over the next mm. week. <laughs> I hope you've got nothing doing. <laughs> yes, no, I think, well, that's, I've put, oh, let me just put the links. I mean, the link for, here's the link for the Christmas party, which is, for, you know, we, we had, I had thought of asking Richard to do a, like a pub style quiz where we could make that a cultural one, couldn't we? And the way we did it before, I think Helen, didn't we do it? We had yes. each oh, just, round was with a different lot of people so that you got to know yeah, different it was, people. It was like a pub quiz. There was a, a round for uh, just general knowledge. And I, I remember there was um, a bit of a brain teaser as well with working out what all the different um, expressions were. So that was lovely. And then, you know, Rachel, you've been doing that today. By the way, it was fantastic. Thank you so much. It was brilliant. Um, brilliant talk. But yeah, just sort of working out a few expressions, idioms in different languages. So you could have maybe a little French group or a German group and then coming back together and then having a chat about what the differences are between them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was that was really good last time. But I was thinking as well, Helen, as we did last time, we all had our hats and uh, accoutrements. <laughs> oh, yes, I still got my, no, you won't put it on because it can be a surprise. Well, well, yes, there last time. Time. I've got my reindeer antlers ready to go, Helen. <laughs> so we could have, we could get dressed up. I think that would be really good. And I think after the year that we've had, I think a little bit of jollity would be just, just what mm -hmm. we need. <laughs> because you mentioned also, Rachel, about um, board games and about different cultures having different games. And I know that Joe Dale has been introducing us to people who've been telling us how we can bring these board games on because it's sometimes quite difficult to imagine how can you do that online but it is possible isn't it joe i don't know if you're there but that's the sort of thing perhaps we could introduce that and have ludo and something like um flippity mm. they have um you know we could have a cultural snakes and ladders mm. that might work mm. so uh, lots of ideas and you can tell from helen's enthusiasm she won every round so although we kept on changing the people, the rest, it the was everyone you were in, they always won. <laughs> well, Beware. I what don't we all to keep that up. <laughs> what we all need is a week off so that we can prepare for this <laughs> meeting now. Let's just finish term early. Let's let's get ourselves ready for next week. <laughs> so I'm hoping people are writing ideas in there. And then yeah, I mean perhaps if I'm on the event right when I Get in touch with everyone with the link if you're ready to contribute something that would be good so we've got lots of ideas there i can see joe is just doing a little bit of a nod there 
I can't see I can't see Joe. Well, or me. For me, he's just at the bottom there, but I suppose we all change around, don't we? Well, I'm gonna make sure that I can Oh there he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so nice to see everyone's faces though. Yes. I've got to go to page two to see the so Mario Deal, you're on page two. Now Mario Deal was obviously very concerned about the French about French spellings and at what point are we going to be requiring people to use reform spelling? So that was, you know, again prompted by what you were saying. And my understanding is that it's it's compulsory for French textbooks as from 2016, but they've all said we're allowed to use any that we want. But I don't know if anybody's got Danielle. You're normally my go-to on anything to do with spelling and culture. I don't know whether you can shed any light on it. I did get in touch with AQA to ask them about their lists because they didn't originally have them mentioned. Yeah. Well, it was meant to change in 1996. Mm -hmm. That's how fast it's, you know, it's working through the system. It, yeah. It's it's quite a slow thing, isn't it? Uh, I remember when we had we launched the spelling bee when Y was still the way of spelling Y, and and um, we only got to a point. I think we probably now still accept it. I can't even I can't even remember, but but certainly we said this is how it is now, um, but it's still being taught as, as Y in, in, in many places and still being used. And you know, things take a very, very long time, no matter what the authorities say um, online and, and how many messages they give, it's, it's a very, very, very long deal language change, even when there's an official body that's in charge of it. Um, of course, it takes nothing for a word to come into the language. You know, um, we, we're kind of inventing new words all of the time. Um, but when you want to change somebody's pattern and impose it from outside and say, you will spell this like this and you you will do this like mm. that. I, I'm actually mourning the loss of um, the tilde on, on solo, which has now been deemed unnecessary and, and on este as well as a as a as a um, pronoun other than, uh, rather than an adjective. I thought, well, that was brilliant to have the, the accent when it's actually um, when it's actually replacing a noun rather than. But anyway, so obviously not nothing to do with me. I'm not allowed to have a view. Um, the Rai has spoken and that is what we all need to be acknowledging now. So the interesting yeah. thing on the French, though, was I think that you're right, Danielle, that it was ages ago that it was. I thought it was 1990, but it was a long time ago. And then it was just a newspaper article, which then got everybody excited about because they they didn't really know about it or had, the penny hadn't dropped I don't think had it and it was when at the point at which they said that um I think it was when school textbooks had to toe the line that was when it all started again with the French and it is it's spell it's accents and spellings as well well they, they've also changed haven't they in, in French they've introduced um they've the feminization of certain professions mm -hmm. um so yeah. you can now it should now be or could now be or can now be i don't know how much should there is about it you know professor with an e um and you know there, there will be widespread ignoring that i'm sure <laughs> from you well, know that's it, interesting because it's different in france in french from france and french from canada Oh. Um, so, uh, auteur, uh, because I introduced myself as an auteur um, in French, and I've just been told by somebody from Quebec, oh, do you mean autrice? Ah, oh, wow. <laughs> so it's quite, uh, yes. Oh, there you go, um, that, that's, that's socio-cultural yeah. Lexus in operation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And um, the fact that the Académie Française gets involved, gets the, the, the sort of back of the French, you know, they don't like being told how to say things. So you have the Académie Française telling, telling you that it's la COVID and then the general population using le because it, it came in naturally as a masculine name, but and that's changing in the media now. You tend to see more la cozy. Ooh. But I have, I have a cultural question. Well, I have a lexical question for for um, French native speakers, please, or anyone who knows um, better French than me. Um, the two genders for Noel. There's yeah. le Noel, which is the religious side of it. Yes, and yeah. la Noel, which is the festivity side of it. Yeah, I love the fact that the that the um, 
the feminine version of the word is all about the partying. I think yeah. that's very apt. <laughs> If it had been the other way around, I would be I would be dissing it, obviously. But the, the fact that it's fallen out the way that I like is just really, really nice. Mm. I think La Noël is not used that much, really. Oh, well, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's typical, isn't it? We need to start it's, using it more. But it's more my grandparents' generation. They would say, on fait La Noël. Oh, let's bring it back. Mm. As Laura's just rewritten, La Fête de Noël is probably, perhaps it's come from that La Fête de Noël. Ah, yeah, that's a good thought. Mm. Mm. Well, lots of good thoughts here. Yes. I know, we could write a book. We could. Mm. Well, it's, well, that's why we're here, isn't it? We've chosen this. We're a bit a self-selecting group, aren't we, really? We're people who like languages, like culture. And like being here on a Saturday afternoon. So that makes us very, very special, I feel. Very special. <laughs> Some people would be saying special in a particular way there, wouldn't they? But <laughs> what do you think, David? David is the now David, not a language teacher, but <coughs> you're even you're here. You could unmute yourself and Yeah, I, I I sometimes feel a little bit like an outsider, and it's just fascinating to hear you all talk. Uh, as you know, Helen, I've I've kind of been in the background now, especially with AWL now for 30 years, and I don't like being in the forefront. It scares me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's just interesting to see how much you all infuse each other. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, no, nobody can beat languages teachers. Not, not like that lot from maths. They're terrible. <laughs> Close the door. My husband's through there. <laughs> speak up a little bit. <laughs> Stephen's got his hand up. Helen, He's very gonna, polite, Stephen. Is this a good time to mention our event on Thursday? Oh, yes. So yes. On Thursday, you know, we've been doing work around speaking with the new speaking endorsement uh, regulations for GCSE. So on Thursday, we're going to have another one of these events in the evening, uh, which is going to be like a big brainstorm, basically. And it's so that language teachers can share ideas of what they are doing in their ordinary classroom teaching and learning with their GCSE classes, what they are doing in the way of speaking, which is going to allow them to give their students the endorsement they need at the end of the year. So if you'd like to come along, that's the link there, and you're very welcome. You're still allowed to come to this. Oh, I don't know about the party. I imagine you're allowed to come to the party, Margaret, even if you're not an AWL member. Everybody's uh, everybody is allowed because what we like, what we like to do is to have we have all these events for free, and we hope that you really like us and you think, oh, actually, I'd quite like to join them. <laughs> and we have had people through our webinars. We had somebody at the last webinar saying that she had joined, and she put it as being, well, you know, it's the price of a tank of petrol, and it's really worth it. <laughs> So that would be lovely to have you. We, and we don't put big pressure on you to be. We just say to people every time, who's, who's a member of AWL? It'd be nice if you joined. So you'd be very, very welcome. Real. But I think certainly, yes, it does sound like a strap line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you'll get to know people as well. Because really, it is like a little family, isn't it? Very much so. It's yeah. impressive, very, very impressive. Obviously, coming from the corporate world, my world is, is very different, but when I indulge myself with you a lot, it's fantastic. <laughs> and Stephen has the image, don't you, Stephen? You talk about it, it's the home, the home of language teachers. It's a home and it's a family, and like all homes and families, not everyone agrees with everybody else all the time, but that's fine. It's the talking about it that's important. Mm -hmm. So wise, so wise is Stephen. And there was a lot of comment as well, regretting the fact we don't have so much content from the BBC, which of course was great on the culture. And Stephen was behind all of the wonderful programmes that we had, which some of which are still available, because I noticed that Susie put links, I think, to things which are still around. So, right. I don't know if anybody else has got any other... Questions I could have just seen. My my cook has come through and got um, dinner out of the freezer in the garage. Did <laughs> what you did share? And go through there. <laughs> I hope you're providing for us all. <laughs> what you need to know about Helen's garage is it also contains tins of Quality Street. So it may be that's what they're having for their dinner. I know. There are fewer tins now, though, Stephen. I'm afraid I've succumbed. But they're still two for £5. Go and get some more. Yeah, I should do. 
I have an idea for the quiz. Oh, what's that? Would you like to try and help me understand the British culture and life in the UK? Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm doing the life in the UK test because I've been here 40 years, so it's not enough for me to know about this country. And I'm just amazed of the, uh, the questions that they ask. And I'm sure that if I asked all of you lot, the indigenous people, oh, yes. you'd struggle. <laughs> you should be stripped of your citizenship. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and we, were, we probably wouldn't care about that either so much. Um, yeah, I, I delved into that test, actually. There's, there are a couple of extracts from that test in, in those... Um, Cult, in those cultural slide links that I that I showed because I thought it was really fascinating to to find out what what someone has decided you need to know in order to be a citizen of this country but yeah it, it includes a lot of things that that I didn't know I mean seriously though I think that would be quite a fun thing to include be fun. wouldn't it yes yeah, so yes. we'll be in touch I don't know how I'm saying all of this I'm not sure how well we're all in touch by email aren't we I suppose. anyway but, bye everybody bye, bye. love you your backdrop much. All right then. Yes, she always has a lovely backdrop. My mm. computer says no to putting up anything behind me. Yeah, it, mine. It, I've got the laptop is just not sophisticated enough to cope with. I've been promised because I'm still on Windows Seven, so I've been oh. promised that when it get when it updates, I may be able to get a. I mean, it's not. I don't know if you can't really see very much, can you? Really? No, it's absolutely fine. It's very homely. Hi, Margaret. <laughs> so it's Windows. <laughs> but screens four is that right helen sorry windows seven but screens four screens three only three yes <laughs> only it's not let's not boast too much <laughs> although actually um it was julia morris who was saying yes but real pros can do it with one that it was seen as a really you know it's pathetic that i need three screens <laughs> well yeah you, c you can't ever go back to one once you've had two. No, that's what um, Joe said, yeah. And it is, it's just when you're creating stuff, just to be able to just take things from one screen to another to another. But I'm still not quite sure where things are gonna pop up. That's my problem. Yeah. yeah. It's wherever yes. it was last, really. That is true. I'm incapable. Hi, I'm incapable of remembering which screen is, is screen one. Mm. <laughs> We're just screen two. Oh. So lovely to see everyone. Yes. Well, thank you. And still in lots of nice comments. I never, by the way, everybody, I never just close the room. I wait for you all to go because I always feel it's quite an, un, an unfriendly thing that something comes up in your screen just saying the host's decided to go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I warn you, you could be so, here for many hours. Yes. So do, you feel, do you feel that you can go? <laughs> Class dismissed. Now, the... Um, I just had a... There was just a lovely message in the chat saying it was first time here... Oh. And and enjoyed it, so yeah. isn't that nice? And another one for the family. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's been lovely. These were, I mean, this has been for all of these sad times. And I suppose I'm aware. I just thought, you know, I never bit at the beginning talk about the fact we're in dreadful times because I just think I hear it so much. I know, but there have been upsides, haven't there? And this has been one of it, one of them mm. that we've just, yeah. you know, got to know even more people. And yeah, and actually realizing that you don't have to wait until you can physically get over to somebody's school to have a meeting with them. You know, I, I think that there was quite a bit of resistance to, to doing stuff online. There was yeah. quite a lot of talk about it being clunky and then internet dropping out. And you think, well, now we're just, now we're not phased by any of that. It drops out, you get back on. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, and it certainly beats, you know, having to, well, obviously at the moment it, it's our only choice, but but I think there'll be things that will stay in place in schools and meetings and inter collaborations between schools will be a lot more fluid and a lot more um, regular than they than they yeah. have ever been because you can just have meetings across all of your schools with people not having to move anywhere. So you don't have to say, oh, you know, I'll meet you at the end of 2021 when everyone's free um, because you can make yourself free for a half hour meeting and just log mm -hmm. on. And I know but, something that you're often talking about as well is the idea of the, and that's probably what you're meaning as well, the primary to the secondary and this sort of thing. So we try to have meetings with our primary schools, but it's, and people come and it is nice to come. It's nice to see each other. It's nice to have our tea and rich tea biscuits. <laughs> but, you know, really just the idea that you'd be able to, 
as you say, people have now got used to this, so perhaps they will not resist it. Yeah. In the, in the past, I do feel people have resisted and felt, mm, no, it's not the same, or I'm not sure about it, but we've had to become comfortable with it, haven't we? Yeah. And with individuals as well, you know, the choosing choosing a Zoom rather than writing backwards and forwards to each other, mm. um, again, that, yeah. that's becoming an easier and preferred way mm. um, of, of getting in contact and you know, yeah. talking about very specific things for a very short amount of time. It's... And I realise, as usual, I'm still recording this. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Perhaps, perhaps we are.